Um, this is um, a, a workshop we're talking about how cr to create, maintain a healthy culture. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll, we'll dialogue about that, what we're doing at Canvas to create a healthy culture. Um, and, and then um, after the very end, then we'll talk about um, just very a practical thing of how do you know when you're hitting a lid in your leadership? So that's sort of how we'll, we'll end is how do you know when you're hitting a lid in your leadership? I have 10 uh, identifiers that you can look at because we all have lids. And you can actually, if you don't mind, leave the lights up if that's okay for a recording. Um, if you can leave the lights up, that'd be cool. Um, they're, they're not ugly. So, okay. That will, that will be great. Um, we're, um, so make sure you're in the right class if this is the class you want to be in. Culture is huge. And what I like about this workshop is this applies no matter where you're at on the organizational chart. And um, if you're a dad or a mom, it works in your home. You can take these principles um, because everywhere you go, there's a culture that you live within. And you can either respond to the culture um, or you can, or you can um, create a culture. Um, and um, it depends on, on, on where you're at and the influence that you have. Um, so I honestly teach this more out of a, as a dad and, a, and as a spouse um, to my wife and the culture that we want to have at home. Um, and then you just sort of take the same principles and you apply it to, um, to the place that I work. Um, but the, the, the key there is um, these, are, these are transferable um, really between organizational um, work or your home life. So I hope you listen to it, think about it that way. You're going to take that ring out. You're working on that, right? The, the ring, 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 ring. That'd be awesome. Um, so, so let's start with, uh, oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, let, let's talk about culture. We all experience it. We all live in it. We're all responding to it. Um, and, and I think one of the key things that we want to talk about here is that how do you create a culture? Um, how, do you, how do you create a culture that's healthy, that, that people want to be part of, that people um, want to experience, and that, that people want to be, um, um, to reproduce? So, so creating a culture, it really culture is a, is a set of shared attitudes, a set of shared values, a, a set of shared goals and practices that characterize um, really a, a family or an institution or an organization. I'll repeat that. Um, culture is a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterize an institution or an organization or a family. You learn more about an organization or a family by watching their values ever than by watching really what they produce. How they produce it is their culture. That's critical. I, I've seen churches and I've worked with churches that do a great job having a phenomenal social media presence and their church looks so great. But when you understand their culture, you see how dysfunctional it is. Because people are dying on the right and the left that are part of that. And it looks cool, but everybody's dying in the process. Um, when, I, when I went to Canvas Church, I wanted to make sure that church was fun, that church was exciting, and that church was healthy. And, um, and that didn't come from preaching great sermons, and it doesn't come from leading an awesome staff meeting. It comes from creating a healthy culture. Um, I, I remember a time when we were, my wife and I had been married about 10 years, and she made a great statement to me at a time. I was very driven, um, doing my ministry at the time, and she goes, Kevin, I wish you had the same vision for our family as you did for the church. Ouch. I gotta sneeze, I'm allergic to it still. <clears throat> I'm a two sneezer, here's another one coming. <laughs> it's right there. I pulled the hair out of my nose this morning and it hurt and it made my eyes water. And when I looked in the mirror, it was the wrong hair. So I had to do it again. I'm still in recovery mode. Um, but my wife said, I wish you had the same vision for our family as you did for, um, for, for the church that you were leading. And you know what she was saying is, I wish we had that same kind of culture. And that's what we did. We went on a mission together. We go, let's create the kind of culture we would want in our home, a shared attitude, a shared value, a shared goal, shared practices. Um, why do people act and respond a certain way in your office or on your staff? It's the culture. Why do people respond a, a certain way? Culture is something that um, you have even if you've never created it. So here's what I want you to do right now on a piece of paper that you're on or whatever. I want you to write down three culture-defining statements about your culture. 
If you were to say this happens in our culture, write three things down that you think is part of it. If you're a, if you're a children's pastor, think of it from that perspective. Is the, is the culture that I have in my kids, what are the three defining statements? Okay, let's hear some of them. Who wants to say one of their cultural statements? Just shout it out. Learn from your mistakes. That's a great cultural statement. Very good. What else? Make it better. Make it better. Just don't do it the day after the event. And don't talk about the chicken. <laughs> it was cold. Okay, what else? What's another one? Huh? Have fun. That's a great one. Have fun. Ours is work hard, play hard, rest hard. That's great. It's another cultural defining statement. Serve, serve one and attend one. Okay, that's a great cultural statement in your church. Serve one and attend two. Attend one, serve one. Awesome. Well, here, here's the thing. Here's what I wanted to do. The first three steps on creating a culture where that's a reality and not just written down. The first thing you have to do is you have to communicate the culture. You have to state the culture that you want. Otherwise, you're just responding to the culture. There, we all have it. But if you want a certain culture, you have to create that culture. You have to communicate that culture. You have to say, what is the intentional culture that you're wanting to establish? What do you want? And communicate it to your team. So at Canvas Church, what we did is we established 12 statements that define the culture of how we want to do life. 12 statements. And we got this idea. I was reading a book called um, um, Great by, um, or uh, Great by, not Great by Choice. That's the book I'm going to refer to. A choosing to be great. No, great by choice by Jim Collins. And he studied all these businesses, and then we hit the recession, and half of the businesses that he wrote about died. So that made that book, you know, had some good points, but they died. Then he came back and he wrote another book, Choosing to Be Great. And he studied the, the businesses that continued to do well during the recession and then compared it to the ones that did not do well. And he found that they had a very clear culture that was defined of how people were to operate and they felt more like a family in it. He called it the Smackless, specific, methodical, and consistent. Don't worry about that because I, I just took the name Smackless and I go, that's what we're gonna name our culture at our church. And if you don't live according to our culture, we're gonna smack you. So that became our Smackless, M-A-C. And, and we have 12, 12 defining sta uh, statements that we live by. And if you were to come to Canvas Church and just spend one week with us, you would hear in probably two or three days every one of these statements. They, they're said all the time. I'll give you three of the ones that we have. One of them is we give each other the benefit of the doubt. We live by the benefit of the doubt. Um, we live by that. We, we, we say it all the time, giving the benefit of the doubt. I heard it on, um, on Monday of this week because I knew I was going to be teaching this workshop. I counted how many times I heard that. I heard that statement in our office four times. And someone would say, well, as we were giving them the benefit of the doubt, it's just part of who we are. It's part of our vocabulary. It's our language. Number two, the name on the front of the jersey is more important than the name of the back of our jersey. So we're made up of individual players, but we all play for the same team. And that's important. Um, we're not personality um, driven, but we, are, we do leverage personalities um, for the name on the front. Um, we want to be capital big C church and not our own deal. So that's part of our culture. Um, we make decisions by that all the time. So a, a, a way that that is put out in our culture is um, if, since the name is more important than um, on the front than on the back, we don't really leverage Kevin Gear's name. We leverage Canvas Church. We're not, when we go to um, advertise or, or whatever, we're, we're not talking about Kevin, we're talking about Canvas. We've decided that's the emphasis, that's the model, that, that's the point we, we want to do. I don't have to be at, I don't have to speak at every gathering. It's not like I, if I'm traveling, we have to show a little video of me introducing the speaker. It's, we don't want, we're going to leverage my personality. That's, God's given that to me. But Canvas is going to be um, our, our, our driving force. Another one that we say is we want people to like Canvas and love God. That's part of our culture. So as much as we might use Canvas as a tool to communicate the gospel of Jesus, what brings change is not Canvas. I say it to all our newcomers. Every time they come, we do a, something called backstage. We pull them all back, and we'll be sitting there, and um, we'll, we'll talk about the church, and then I get, they allow me to say one thing. And I walk up, and I say this every time to our new, our, our new guests. I go, Here, here's the truth. I want you to like Canvas. I really do. 
but I want you to love God. Canvas won't change your life, but God will change your life. Canvas is just the best tool that we know to communicate Jesus and do community together. So would you join us on this journey as we're all trying to figure out the Jesus adventure and we'll like Canvas, but we're gonna fall in love with God? Um, that's part of our culture. And that gets implemented all the way through everything we do because we don't become Canvas driven, we become God driven, Jesus driven. Um, we just wanna leverage Canvas as a tool. Um, so you have to communicate the culture. I'll give you one more. Um, and I, this is one of my favorite ones, and that is the mission is greater um, of, uh, greater of importance than any person's emotions. So we'll offend you for the sake of the mission of Jesus, and we're cool with that. That the mission is more important than people's emotions. That's why um, every Wednesday night, so our weekend starts on Wednesday, because we have a Wednesday night gathering, but I preach the same message on Wednesday night that I do on Saturday and that I do on Sunday. Um, and so it's, our weekend, weekend starts on Wednesday, was what we say. At the end of every Wednesday night, um, I go and meet with a team of six to eight people that critique my speaking every week. So every time I get done speaking, they critique me. And, and sometimes they're brutal. One time, one of the critiquers said, Kevin, I just gotta tell you, you look so fat in that clothes. You need to change your clothes for the weekend. I'm like, I like you, idiot. Um, but, um, and I had to change. I had to change, it was not good enough. Uh, sometimes it's your, your joke wasn't funny or nobody got it or it seems funny to you, but it wasn't. Um, I hear that one quite often, actually. Um, <laughs> Or, um, Kevin, you camped on point two for so long that really point three had nothing. So, so they critique me. Why would, why would we do that? Because the mission is more important than my emotions. It's hard, but I truly believe in the mission. And when my emotions become more important than the mission, well, then, you, then you, God's not going to honor that. And so that's part of our culture. I want that culture. Now, do I like that culture? Most of the time. Sometimes it really sucks. But um, we're committed to this. Well, the only way you're ever going to get there is if you communicate it. And here's the thing that's so unique. You, when it comes to culture, you never have a healthy culture. Let me say it this way. You never have an established healthy culture. You don't. You're always fighting for a healthy culture. Healthy cultures just don't emerge. You, you put two people in a room and shut the door, and over time, they're going to fight. I've been married 21 years. I get it. At some point, they're going to, because you don't have, you don't have, just by two people in a room, you don't have a healthy culture, and you never will get a healthy culture without intentionality. Why? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our natural drift, Hebrews 2.1, uh, is be careful that you do not drift away. We, we, we are just bent for dysfunction. We are gifted in dysfunction. Um, so we have to be intentional about creating the kind of culture that we want. And then you never believe you've established it. You always fight for it. You're always fighting for the healthy culture. I, every day, I've been in this culture for six years, and every day I have to remind myself the mission is more important than my emotions. Because my emotions are always right there. Mission is more important. I, every time I read the connection cards, we do something like this. We don't have them put it up here. We take it, an offering. It's called the connection card. We do it every week. And I read them. And every time I read every one of them, there's going to be someone that doesn't like something I say. And you got to remember, the mission is more important than my emotions. I hope they love Jesus. And if they do, I hope they get ran over on the way home because they're going to go to heaven. You know. Um. So first thing you have to do is you have to communicate your culture. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the statements that you wrote down. And when's the last time you taught those to your team? And if you haven't, you're hoping and you're assuming your team just gets them. You're not creating a culture. You have to talk about it. So what we do is these 12 statements, I personally read them every Monday. First thing I do when I get to my office, I read my 12 statements. I have them all here. Um, but you know, life is messy, people are screwed up, God is big, we work hard, play hard, rest hard, we gear to the young, we lean into the wisdom of the old, we hold on to everything loosely, um, ministry doesn't happen at the expense of the volunteer, we don't listen to they. So we have these, whole, these 12 sentences, these 12 statements. Um, I read them, and then we quiz our, our team about them. We, we, we quiz our team. So um, about a few months ago, we were doing a, um, a staff meeting, I said, we're going to have a written exam on all 12 of our cultural statements. So come prepared for them. I mean, you have to get them 100% right or you have to take the test next Tuesday. Um, 
which they hated. They did not like that. It was not fun. But the mission is more important than their emotions. And so um, we, they came into the deal. We had, I had all the paper f- filled out. I had the 12 blanks ready, for, had pens ready for them. They all come in. They're sitting down. There's about 30 of us in the room. And I go, okay, get ready. And um, we're going to take the test here in your times. Okay, you have 10 minutes to write these down. I go, are, are you ready? On your marks? Get set. Oh, wait, let me, tell you, let me tell you one more thing about our smack list. One of the things our smack list says, I'm going to give you one right now, so you only have to do 11, because I'm giving you one right now, and that is um, nobody goes alone. We do things as a team. And that even means this test. So get into teams and take it together. And they're all like, yeah, this is great, you know, and, and then we got to do the test together um, because we're a team, and it was a great time teaching that one point. Um, so if, if you want to establish a, a, a culture, you got to communicate the culture, which means you have to know where you want to go first. can't communicate it if you don't know it. And that's why I would encourage you to take the time and go, what kind of culture do we want to create? Then number two, um, so after you communicate it, because you know where you're going to go, and then you're communicating it, so I guess that could be number two. Number three then would be personally live the culture. you got to personally live the culture. If your team or your church does not see you living the culture personally, then all it is is a bunch of talk or it's a bunch of words on a piece of paper. I want people in my church to invite their friends So I will often tell stories of times I invited my friends to church. I want them to reproduce the culture that I want. I want to create the culture and the expectation um, that is who we are. We invite people. Another example of how I live out our, our culture personally is making myself available to be critiqued, which I talked about. Um, we got to live it out. People have to see it in your life. If you're the, if you're the one that's establishing this culture, then you got to own it and live it, and it has to be poured out of you. And then when you're talking to people, you got to express the reason I'm doing this. Because some people don't just connect the dots. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. Because isn't that who we are? And then you see this light come on and go, oh, yeah, you got to live it out. You gotta live it out at home. You gotta live it out in your workplace. You gotta live it out when you're driving. That's hard. You gotta live it out, live it out, live it out. What are your statements that define your culture that sound really good? And then do you live it out? Do you live it out? Otherwise, it's fake and it's not real and no one's gonna do it. When we first came to Canvas and um, I was um, in the part of uh, transitioning the church. It was a, it was a rehabilitation kind of a, a church, a revitalization of a church. Um, we had a really dysfunctional team at the time. And um, as we began to, I, I ended up laying off nine people. We began to make um, um, some shifts of, of the direction that we were wanting to go. Um, and we began to implement this culture um, of, of what we wanted. Benefit of the doubt. Mission is more important than your emotions. Um, Well, one of the things I started is we started seeing people spend more time at work and their home life started to really struggle. And so I I was talking to this one lady. I go, tell me what's going on. Why are you spending so much time at work and, and you're not going home? Here's what she said. She goes, I like the culture more at church than I do at my house. And because I'm living in a healthy culture, here, it was amazing, I'm finding how dysfunctional my home life is. She goes, I don't want to go home. At one point in the first year of our church, we had six people on our staff that were in counseling because they had discovered how dysfunctional the culture was in their home by living in a healthy culture. What a great thing for the church to do. To be able to establish a healthy culture because we're so dysfunctional, we don't even know how dysfunctional we are. And if we want to make a change in our communities, let's create a healthy culture, let's communicate who we want to be, and then instead of being hypocrites, let's begin to live it out. Let's begin to talk about it. But the way you establish it, and after it comes to living it out, is you have to hold people accountable to it. The number one thing I do with our team is I'm the number one communicator at the church or the primary communicator at the church. And number two, I keep people accountable to the culture. That's what I do. Every argument or every discussion. Is that, is, is that, is that part of our culture? I'll, I'll give you an example. I had, a, um, I had a, our youth pastor come in and he was having um, problems with his junior Bible quiz director. 
And, um, and she, she had two horns and a tail, so she was quite a lady. And, um, and, and we, he was struggling with her and trying to figure out what he was going to do with her. And, and so he goes, Kevin, I, here's what I've decided to do. Um, because one of our cultural statements at our church is build the kind of team you would want to serve on. So if you're a team builder, build the kind of team you would want to serve on. And, and so he said, here's what I've decided to do. I'm going to give her half of our budget um, for, like, for the first six months. And then if she does okay with the um, first six months, then the latter six months, I'll give her the rest of the budget. Um, it would just help me keep a little bit more control over her. And I thought, that's a really good thinking. That's a good idea. And I go, you bet. Go ahead. Um, you can do that. He goes, thanks. And he turned to walk out. And I go, hey, I just want you to know. Um, you have six months of your budget. And then if you do really well with it, I'll give you six months of it. He turned around and he goes, why? Create the kind of team you want to serve on. I'm just following your lead. It sounds like you want to lead that way. He goes, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to give her. I go, how about you just go have the real conversation with her that you need to have instead of trying to control her through policy and control her through, you just go say, hey, you know what? We're, we're having a tension point. Um, it's, you have to hold people accountable to the culture or we naturally drift away to the easiest route. That will, will, will become the passive-aggressive culture. Anybody know passive-aggressive people? Aren't they fun? Yeah. We're real good at that. So you have to say, I so believe in the culture that I want, I will have the courageous conversations to hold you accountable to it. That means people begin to realize that what you're trying to do is worth fighting for. And what you're trying to do is worth going after for. Um, and, and so then people want to live to it and they find this great freedom in a healthy culture because they know what is expected of each other. Um, one of the statements in our culture is um, um, we have each other's backs. Here's what that means when we live it out. There is never a meeting after the meeting. That, 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 would, that would not work within our culture. Because we want to build this kind of team you want to serve on, it means I, if I was serving on a team, I would want to have voice and influence. That means if I lead a team, I need to give voice and influence. And if I'm giving voice and influence, if you have something to say, say it in the team. Because what's not going to happen is after the meeting's over, we're going to go talk about the meeting. That is so dysfunctional. You know what that's called? Let's see if I can find the biblical word for it. Gossip. That's what it is. So we decided we have each other's backs. Well, the way we have each other's backs is we want to create a culture that every time you walk into my office or I walk into your office, we know where each other stands because there's no other conversations happening in the background. You know how hard it is when, when you walk in and you're wondering what your, your boss is thinking about you or you're wondering what that teacher thinks about you? Like, and, and you're trying to read between the lines. Part of the reason why we had to create this culture is I'm terrible at picking up clues and reading between the lines. I'm sort of more of a direct kind of person. It helps me understand. I'm just slow. Um, and so it helps me when people are direct. But when, we, when we've hired people and they come into this culture, they, they, they struggle with this. Because they'll come in and they go, hey, you know, wait, like, how am I doing? Well, I told you, you're doing great. I mean, I just told you two hours ago, you're phenomenal. I know, I'm just wondering, like, is there a hidden message there? Because <laughs> it, it's hard because we live often in the dysfunctional culture that we think there might be more than more than there is more, and we're always trying to search for it and find it. You know how fun it is when I can go into a meeting, sit down, and what's going to be discussed is the real issues and when we leave, we can fight over those issues, we can argue over those issues, and then afterwards, let's go have lunch and enjoy each other. And we really do, and there's nothing said about it. Oh, it, it allows creativity to explode. Um, and then, you want to create that in your home. Um, one of the values that we have in our home, which is different than our work, is there's no secrets between mom and dad. No secrets between mom and dad. And it has been awesome because our kids have grown up and they, you know, when a child is born, they have one mission that is to divide and conquer between mom and dad. Um, that, that's all they do. That's all they think about. You know, they're evil. Um, they need Jesus. I still have a four-year-old that doesn't know Jesus yet. And um, someday she will give her life to Jesus. But right now she's just little Satan. And, and, and I love her. I love her. She just needs Jesus. Divide and conquer. And so part of our, part of our value in our culture, in our home, is there are no secrets. There are no secrets between mom and dad. 
And it's been great and freeing because now I, can, I have four girls and one boy. Um, and we, I can talk to my girls about anything. Um, you know, and as they're getting older, I have a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old, and their bodies are changing and things are going on, and, and it becomes comfortable because as they're talking to mom about stuff, she, they're going to be like, they'll sometimes go, are you going to tell dad? And she'll go, well, I tell dad everything. And they smile like, oh, but they love it at the same time. And then I'll walk in, and I'll go, hey, here, you're grumpy, you know. And then they cry, and then I don't understand why they're crying. I just said that they were grumpy. But there's something beautiful about that. We have to be intentional about it, but this is the culture that we want to create. And you know what else? They're going to have that kind of a marriage someday because a healthy culture you want to reproduce. But it only comes if we communicate it. It only comes if we live it. And it only comes if you hold them accountable to it. Now go back and look at the list of the things that you wrote down. And here's where you can tell if you're establishing a culture. When is the last time you had a courageous conversation with someone in your organization about that item that you wrote down? And if you haven't, you, you don't have that kind of a culture. That's the tension right there that you're feeling about establishing a healthy culture. It has to be fought over. You constantly are reaffirming it. You're constantly working toward it. And the minute you take your foot off the gas pad pedal, you begin to drift to a reactionary culture. A healthy culture has to be fought for. Um, let, me give you a, let me give you a couple others of, of the ones that we've written down. Um, uh, little things matter. I was at a, I was, this is one of our cultural items in our church. We believe in little things. Um, and let me tell you how this sort of weighs itself through our organization. By the way, this is not just for paid employees. This is for all of our volunteers in our church. So our, our preschool teachers are trained on what our list is um, because we want to multiply it down. A healthy culture is worth um, um, creating all the way down. Um, but one of the things is we have little things matter. And, um, I, was, I was teaching at a church in Minnesota. And we sat down and um, I was, spent all day Sunday with them. I was teaching there and um, I'd met with their board on Saturday and then we were doing a training that night, Sunday evening with just the pastoral team. Well, it was um, 9.55 and the worship team started playing in the main auditorium, 9, 9.55 in the morning on Sunday. And I was out in the lobby and I looked up at the clock and I saw that it said 9.55. It's a big clock right above the door. And I go, oh, are we starting early? And the pastor that was standing next to me goes, oh, no, it's actually 10 o'clock. That, that clock is, is five minutes slow. I go, oh. I go, I, I didn't know that. So I guess I'm late. So then I had to walk down and, and get in there. Um, well, I made a, uh, there was two more gatherings to, to go still. So I, I went to every pastor that I could in between gatherings, and I asked them this simple question. Do you know that that clock is five minutes slow? Every pastor knew in that church that the clock was slow. Every one of them. Then I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I went outside, and I looked to find where all the pastors parked. And all the pastors parked in some of the prime parking, which I had noticed, actually, when I had drove in that morning. Um, I had noticed all their cars. So that night, we're talking about the smack list. And it wasn't our smack list. It was their smack list that was on the wall. They had stolen some of ours. I had given them to them from, um, about a year before. And the one that they had took was Little Things Matter. <laughs> this is going to be fun. So that night, we're at their church, or we're at their pastor's house. We're all sitting on couches. And I go, I just want to talk about your smack list. Let's go through it. First of all, I add a couple. We told some stories about how they do it. And then we came about number four. And I go, Little Things Matter. You guys believe that one? I mean, they were like, yes! Oh, that's a good one. We do that. Okay, let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you know that the clock in the auditorium, um, in the lobby, is five minutes slow? And you immediately saw this. I go, no, 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 I want you to raise your hand if you know. They all did. And I said, don't tell me little things matter. You have a, P, you have a statement on a piece of paper that you do not believe and you do not live. How long has the clock been five minutes slow? Oh, then they're talking, it's like a month, two months. I go, unacceptable. And then I looked at the lead pastor in a gentle, loving way. And I go, it is your job to reinforce this culture. You know what I wanted to do that day? 
I was so frustrated. I wanted to go get a ladder and change it myself. I go, now next time I come back to this church, if that clock is five minutes slow, you're all fired. No. It's true. Because if you don't hold them accountable and make big deals out of things like this, you don't have that kind of a culture. They thought they were living a culture and they did not have it. If your culture is serve one, attend one, you got to be asking that question to people all the time. So when do you serve? I just attend here. Do you know that what we're trying to do, our culture here is attend one, serve one? You're not serving. you got to serve. It's what we do. That, that intrigues people to be part of it because it's connected to them. Well, then I brought up the parking. So where do you park? Oh, heads go back down. It was like, it was like Jesus was ready to come. It was awesome. I go, does anybody know where I parked? And I'm a guest at your church. They're like, ah, no, I didn't see where you parked. I go, you wouldn't see where I parked. I parked out of the parking lot a half a block away. Because little things matter. I'm just expecting a guest is going to need the parking spot in the parking lot. I would never park in our parking lot. Because little things matter. And it just might be this day that my neighbor that I'm working on comes and it's cold and I want them to, and it was snowing that day, I want them to park in a good parking spot. Why would I take it? Little things matter. I walk to church every time. At Canvas right now, because little things matter, I park in a, in a, in a gravel parking lot out nearby the uh, back road. And I walk all the way up because little things matter. And do you know what's amazing about that? When you live your culture and you talk about your culture and, and, and you hold people about, accountable to their culture, they want to live it. Now all of our staff parks out there. And it creates this idea that guests matter, little things matter. Now, here's the hard part. The more you begin to live it, the more comfortable you become with it, and you start to make small compromises. Culture is always degrading. It's always breaking down. So be intentional about going after it holding people accountable to it. Okay, any questions or thoughts on culture? Is this helpful? Yeah. Thoughts or comments? Questions? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great statement. I think above all, I think children's and youth ministries, the answer is the same. It is unbelievable how much as a children's leader you have influence in creating your own culture. And you might, um, w within your kids' ministries. You know, one of the things that's awesome about kids' ministries and also is the curse of kids' ministries is most of the time you are off the radar of what's happening in your kids' ministries in your, on your Sunday. It's not like you have a lot of adults coming in to monitor and watch your kids' ministries. You're just off the radar. It's just real. So embrace it and love it. But here's the good news about it. And here's the bad news about it. You can wing it every week and no one's going to know. You can get there and just fly by the seat of your pants and no one's going to know. And the kids, they're just going to be happy. That's the negative part about it. Positive part about it is you can create the culture that you want. Um, when I was children's pastor at, at Westwood, uh, we created um, a, a culture. Number one was you're always 15 minutes early. Um, and, this, and so that was always, we're always 15 minutes early. I like early. So we're going to be 15 minutes early. If you were not 15 minutes early, what I would do is I'd get everybody who's here. I'd go, who are we missing? Who are we missing? Because we'd pray before everything started. And we're like, oh, Susie's missing. Okay, everybody grab your phones. We're texting Susie all at the same time. So nobody wanted to be on the end of getting all of those texts. In fact, we still do that at Canvas. Staff meeting starts at 9 o'clock. If you're there at 9, oh, nine, if you're there, if you walk in, after the clock goes to nine o'clock, you have to buy everybody on the team breakfast the next day. It is amazing how nobody is ever late, okay? But that's the culture that we want because it's our time. We value each other's times. Um, so I think 
Denise, create the culture that you want, talk about it that you want, and you'll be surprised at how it will drift forward or drift upward, and then, and then your pastor will go, I like that, I think we're gonna adopt that as a church. Um, when I was at Westwood, we created the vision statement, I'm reaching children within walking distance of the church. I couldn't find a bus driver, and I didn't want to get a CDL license, because then I would be driving for the senior events. And so um, um, we, um, we, we, we created the vision statement, reaching children in walking distance of the church. Well, we began to reach children in walking distance of the church, and in about a year and a half time, every kid that lived within a mile, every kid um, that was um, five years and above, five to 12, every kid within a mile of the church was walking to church every Wednesday and Sunday morning. Um, that w at least was on our roster. And it was great. It was so, and, and we had created this culture. And this one, it was so exciting that our lead pastor preached a, a, a sermon um, entitled Reaching Every Adult Within Walking Distance of the Church. And that's fun. You can lead upward by creating a healthy culture. And in your kids' ministries, which is off the radar, you should be able to have that statement. Now, our kids' team has taken some of these and, and taken some away and added some of their others just for their own kids' ministries. And then they hold them accountable to them and they teach them to them. It's, it's important that we do that. And it's fun because people know where you're at. They know what you stand for. Yeah? Uh, how do you use your team in creating these statements? Do you bring them up yourself? That's a good question. It's a combination of both. There are some statements that I just believe are vital for where I want to go. So I said, this is, this is the one that I think is important. Um, but we created this as a team. I just was strong on some of them. But we, we said, what, what, else, what else do we want to be like? And so we would talk about that. And, and then some of them have dropped off and new ones have come on. Um, so some of them, one of them was, see if I can remember one that we dropped. Um, I can't remember one that we dropped. I know we've dropped a couple. Um, but one of them is um, that we just added recently in the last year and a half was hold on to everything loosely. And, um, and that came out because we were um, going multi-site and everybody's titles were changing and, um, and roles were changing. And we were, re and we were growing so fast um, that we, in the six years, we've done six reorgs. Um, and every time you reorg, your job changes. Um, and if you hold on to your job like this, you just won't be able to be part of a growing church because um, you're gonna hit a lid or your job's gonna change. And so we have to let you go or something else. So hold on to everything loosely. Because um, you're going to shift around on the bus because we're growing so fast. And so that we added that one. And we began to talk about that. Okay, our culture is hold on to loosely. When we hire people, we're like, like what's, my, what's my title? Well, you work here. That's your title. And um, we want to reach people for Jesus. So hold on to it loosely. Because we're still going to hold on. We're still going to reach people for Jesus. But your title might change. So sometimes we add stuff just by a healthy culture as we're reproducing it needs to shift and change. But we always have people speak into it. Nick? Well, we believe it's 12. <laughs> um, some might be eight, some might be six. Um, um, th that would depend on how, how you lead and how your people respond to it. We're living out 12. Um, we emphasize certain months, certain ones um, through staff meeting. Uh, so every staff meeting, we're highlighting one, talking about one. Um, so we're, we just landed on 12. Um, but you could do six, you could do eight, you could do five. Yeah. Well, I we started with with twelve, and um, because when when I came to the church, I wanted to, to establish a culture, um, a healthy culture. So with my top team at that time, there was three of us. We're like, I said, here's a couple that I want. We dreamed it together to these twelve, and then I said, okay, I'm going to teach these. Um, and then I began every staff meeting to teach a new one and talk about it. And then they're all, you'll, if you listen to any preaching, they're always in my preaching. I, I work those statements into our preaching all the time. Now, they're not our value system. They're just our cultural statements of how we do life. Um, that, 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 so that's, that's why we started with 12. Because that's the 12 things I really wanted. One of the ones that we said, and then no, i got to be done here. I don't know what that, oh, 11.50. One of them is, um, that was huge in our church. Um, is we don't listen to they. So if you ever said, hey, this is what I'm hearing people say, I'll go, who is that? 
They go, well, they don't want to know. Then I don't want to have to hear what they have to say. Taking away they, that we added, that was one we added later, was so powerful. Because they could be your spouse. I don't know. Um, so uh, going back to your question, the culture can shift and change as we grow and different dynamics come. We, we look at that and wrestle with that and go, hey, we need to be this kind of a, this kind of a culture. Any other comments? Those are good questions. Thank you. Yeah. For us, values are big picture. Culture is we're living day to day to day to day to day. Values will have an impact on day to day to day. But we found like in our value statement, one of, them, one of our value statements is the we church, where everybody's involved, the we church. But we, we, that doesn't, it, while it will have an impact on every day, our, we're not saying that every day. In our culture, we're living it out every day with that big picture in mind. But one of our values is biblical authority. Okay, we believe that the Bible is God's word. It does not change. The author does not change. So it's relevant for today. We, we, we believe that, that that affects how we do things, but it's not an everyday influence, personal relationship connection-wise. See that difference there? Someone else had their hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Common language. Common language helps communication. So I'm about to have a conflict with somebody or a tension with somebody, um, and I'm going to sit down and go, hey, because I want to have your back, I want to talk to you about this. Now, they know my intention is good. I'm trying to fit within our culture. They know, and because, because we're a team and nobody goes alone, I, I need to tell you the chicken's cold, okay? We're gonna have a conversation about that. But the heart is good. We trust the culture because we know we're for each other. Also, hey, I need to tell you this, or I, I, people have said this to me. Kevin, can I just tell you this? It's gonna be hard, but the mission is more important than your emotions. And so that's why I'm saying this. It gives us a common language to agree on ever before we get to the disagreement. So defense mechanisms go down. The other thing on top of that, so that, that's, our, that's our culture, is um, we, 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 we read a book, um, and we've, we try to do this every year. One of the books that we just read last year was, um, somebody will know the title of it, Difficult Conversations, Crucial Conversations, gave us common language to have those kind of conversations. So common language is key on that. Shared value system and cultural system is, helps that a lot. Daryl Hanley, I don't know if you know that name. He, we hired him two years ago. He's a nut. Love him. Um, he's just a high energy, fun guy. Um, he came in and after, his, um, after being there a year, his, his statement was, um, you know, I heard all the talk about the culture before I moved here. And I thought it was just a bunch of talk. He goes, but it's so real and so true. He goes, I have deeper relationships here because I know everybody is for me. What a great environment to work in when everybody is really for you and for the mission. That doesn't happen naturally. You have to create a culture that keeps it in front of you. And then you flourish. And then leaders can reach levels that they never could reach before because the healthy culture raises your lid. It will force you to grow. When I was a kids pastor, I took um, a group of kids to Moses Lake for, uh, uh, it was Warden, Washington, for a week of, a week of uh, ministry. We were going door to door with sixth, seventh, fifth, sixth, and seventh graders. And I had one rule, and that was, if I count to three, you're quiet. And if, so one, two, three, you're quiet. And if you ever broke that rule, I kicked you out for an hour outside and you missed whatever we were doing. Um, and so we were non-negotiable, never changes. When we got home from the trip, one of the um, moms asked their son, what was the favorite part of the trip? And this boy, his name was Emmett. Here's what his response was. Mom, I knew what I could do and I knew what I couldn't do. So his mom schedules a meeting with me, comes in, she goes, what? Why would that be his favorite part? I go, it's because when you live in healthy boundaries or a healthy culture to some extent, you truly experience freedom. The greatest freedom in Christ is we're permissible. We're, we're, 
We have the right to do anything, but not everything is wise. We have the greatest freedom now ever. And we experience that wonderful freedom, but we're wise in the way we live it. I think culture helps us think that way, just as adults. So there's my thought on that. Any more? We've got two minutes left. This is just a bonus. You want to hear how you hit a lid real quick? Ten things real quick. I'm just going to read them through. As a church, um, as our church has changed over the course of the years, I've personally hit leadership lids all the time in my life. Um, and, and, and you have to bust through those lids or they stop you from being who God wants you to be. So I just wrote down ten things that can help you recognize when you're hitting a lid, when you're hitting a lid in your leadership. Here they are, ten things. When I respond emotionally, frustrated or angry, I know I'm hitting a lid. So I have to need to step back and go, uh-oh, what is that lid? Help me identify it and how do I get through it? When I respond emotionally, frustrated or angry, I know I'm hitting a lid. Number two, when I make excuses, I know I'm hitting a lid. When I make excuses about how something went or how a ministry went, that, and I know I'm hitting a ministry lid. Number three, when I think impossible before I think possible, I'm hitting a lid. When I think that's impossible before I think that's possible, I'm hitting a lid. I don't want to do that. I want to think possible first. Number four, when I blame my team, I'm hitting a lid. I just did this teaching to our staff last week, and that is if somebody on your team is not succeeding, it's your fault. Don't blame your team. You're the leader of that team. Be an intentional leader, see what's happening, and coach them before it takes place. I've learned that in my own life, that when I blame my team, I'm hitting a lid. Number five, when I stop having fun, I'm hitting a lid. Fun I defined as this. It's funny. Fun, fun is funny, unexpected, and new. Funny is, or fun is funny, unexpected, and new. We just have some moms right now. We, we hired uh, several ladies that are moms, and they're phenomenal on our children's team. But they're moms, and they're thinking like moms. They're not thinking like a fifth grade boy. And so our, we saw that our children's church was sort of wah, 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 wah. It was organized and great, and, um, but it was, la it was safe. I mean, it was really safe. But, but it, was, it was lacking fun. So I pulled all six of our children's people together um, in, in a training. And I'm going, I just tell you, you're doing a great job. And everything is organized. I, mean, I go watch it. And it's just wah, 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 wah. And I go, that, that, we need to add some fun to it. And one of, uh, Shanara, who's a great lady, she goes, well, what's fun? I go, well, fun is funny, unexpected, and new. So watch this. This is how you're doing church. Wah, 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 wah. Imagine if you did it this way. Wah, 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 wah. Ah! Wah, 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 wah. And what happened right there? You're all smiling. And you're all laughing. That's fun. Funny, unexpected, and new. So that was a free one. Okay, let's keep going here. Number six is when I think the answer, am I need to be done? When I think the answer is work harder. If you think the answer is I gotta work harder, you're hitting the lid. I got four of them, we're done. When my home life starts to suffer, regardless of how, how well my ministry life is going, if my home life starts to suffer, I'm hitting a lid. Number eight, when I'm always comfortable, I'm hitting a lid. Last two, and then we're out of here. When I would rather do than lead, you're hitting a lid. And then lastly, when I don't want to let go, you're hitting a lid. Don't hit lids. And if you're intentional about when you hit a lid, you'll rise way above it. Father, go with us, I pray. We love you. It's all about you. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. amen. Thanks for coming, everyone.